have once again gathered together for horror in Boston. Turn of a new leaf. And I turn now to Ivan to let us know what we've won. Yeah, okay. So right now I'm at the bottom of a well, but that's not how things started. Uh, we were initially, um, uh, Alfred Smalls and I met up, and we both have wrong names on our screen, but both, both, so both Terrence McSweeney and Alfred Smalls met up at this restaurant. And we, you know, we crossed paths at that moment because I was um, – with our with the the fellow from the um the uh what do you call him with errol the librarian and i you know get a we get accosted by mickey the fist o'shaughnessy but he looks much much younger and of course um alfred smalls comes out to my, our rescue sort of and uh, eventually mickey o'shaughnessy backs down um the two of us kind of compare notes where he'd been things about the hermetic order and the silver twilight all the stuff kind of retire back to small's apartment um small's ends up showing me this book that he got out of this uh, this case he got from this this farm and the name of the farm is uh, small's help me out the scott farm the scott farm yeah it used to be but it used to be owned by the um or at least used by the this hermetic order um at, at some point you know so uh but you've got this this book from there, and you know we were trying to figure out what do we do now. We you know we both we both experienced the same dream where we're experiencing like this this you know what, what is maybe uh, maybe Gavigan, you know calling for help. You know, but it's a, a spooky dream. But you know the only only real leads you've got at this point is maybe we can go to the Gavigan residence. But we can go check out this Scott's farm. So Smalls really wanted to check out the Scott's farm. We managed to bamboozle this, this young taxi driver to take us down. And we, we, we employed him with some money and, and maybe, maybe the chance to have his name in the, in the paper, this uh, Jimmy White or James White, as his wife likes to call him. <laughs> um, we get down to, and I think he, t- he might have been the person that told us about Stanford. I'm not sure. But one of the people that may have escaped during the police raid on this, on this establishment or the, you know this this house we go to this place it's, it's overgrown it obviously hasn't been occupied in quite some time but it looks like it was done up rather nice uh, it's pretty ramshackle it was sort of kind of destroyed part of it was destroyed by fire but it looks like most of it was just been taken over by nature and as we find nothing really upstairs of any real note i mean there's some there's some pictures there's some some uh, things that might you know which which we grab that they believe a couple of pictures and a couple of documents um you know, talking about various members that might have been in, the, in this order. Nothing really up here. We end up going downstairs. We, we find a, a series of, you know, not quite exactly catacombs, but, you know, a, a layer and then another layer. Um, and it looks like somebody's torn this place apart. And there are all kinds of arcane books. And, you know, I think we you know, find some moldering book by this guy Crowley, which is, you know, somebody's written in the margins about what a not shabby is and completely wrongheaded. But, um, <clears throat> You know, we, we all go all the way down to this this one little area, this little cellar, or, you know, sub cellar, where it looks like people have actually been chained and shackled, and there's this this drain that you know we had to kind of uh, it just it looked rather old, and you know, digging around in there, you know, scraping away some of the growth of God, we knows what kind of algae and muck and critters, um, discover a, a kind of sigil uh, akin to, but not exactly the same as as the one we'd seen, you know, on, on the the coin. Um, and that that I'd had uh, from another um, another member, the the consultant before, um, see uh, some other st- yeah the ring the ring that's exactly it. This, and we we also see some things that are kind of like stylized eyes of Horus, but not really eyes of Horus, but something that's kind of like an imitation of or something. You know, Smalls knows more about that. I mean, just it's just looks like some creepy drawing to to to, to Sweeney McSweeney. But we go up, we go out into the the back of the house, the the old garden. Um, and Smalls ends up having some fun looking through a telescope and see some odd things. But Smalls realizes, oh, there's another structure out there in the woods. So now our driver's waiting for us, but he's not going to wait for us forever. You know, he'll, he might strand us here. So it's winter. So, you know, before it gets dark, we're going to go check out this other. We do, in fact, find another little building, a little wooden building. We go inside and there's this boarded up well. And of course, we take the top off the well. Of course, there are rungs in the well leading down. 
Of course, Smalls <laughs> is probably too corpulent to go down this. So McSweeney, okay, okay, Smalls, I'll go down. I'll check this out. You know, I fall because old rungs, you know, not hurt, except for my pride and maybe my trousers. Um, see a skeleton down there with some kind of broken statue. You know, it might, maybe a broken impact or whatever. So I pocket that because that might be interest, might be important. I don't know. But there's this grate, you know, covering part of the wall. So I take it off and maybe there's another passageway. Well, there is, but it's full of water. Now this freezing cold water is pouring in on me. And I'm trying to climb back up this well. And, and already it just seems like it's, the rung breaks off in my hand. And so I'm, I, I forget how many feet down this well, 50, 40. It's, it's a long way down. And this cold, cold water is starting to rise. And it's winter. It's November. So it's not exactly winter. But it's cold. All right. And that's where we left things. Alfred Smalls in this well room the light of the day is pouring cheerfully through the panes of glass but that throws the base of the well completely into shadow so looking down the shaft you can see the pale you know white oval of Terence McSweeney's face and you can hear the rushing burbling sound and swirling sound of water but the exact details of his predicament are obscured by darkness terrence <clears throat> terrence uh, what's going on down there i'm in a bit of trouble here smalls and a bit of trouble uh, uh, the well started filled with water uh i gotta gotta get back up I suppose there's a well for anything over there. Not well. Can you tread water? If the water comes up and you just tread, it'll bring you up with it. I'll freeze to death first. Is there, is there a rope or something you can lower down to me? Something on that? Uh, I'll look. Sure. Try to grab onto the rungs. I tried. I'm, you know, I'm clang. You know, I, I'm real. I can see him. You know, I'm not quite sure if he can see me or not. I'm just holding the rung up in my hand. You know, that's it's broken off. All right, I'll, I'll look for something I can throw down. But in the meantime, uh, uh, move your arms and your legs. Tread water. Uh, puff up your chest with air. Let the water take you up. Okay. Now, in the well room itself, of course, there was nothing. No, okay. no bucket, no arrangement or of, of, of that at all. It's just a... a abandoned room with nothing left in it and you crossed a fairly wide field of tall grasses to get here after coming through the forest path to the house okay um how far down uh are you terence right now how, how i'm looking down at your little face uh and if you <laughs> And if you were to or reach up an arm, feet, maybe yeah. forty or fifty feet. Good lord! Um, all right. Um, and I don't remember seeing anything out in the field that would help. All right. Um, hold on, I've, I've got an idea, and I will uh, take off my my outer coat. Uh, and then I will take off my, I will just sort of shuck off my shoes, my, my, my duck boots. I will take off my pants and tie them to, in other words, I'm making sort of like a rope, you know, like a bed sheet, you know, like a, a thing out of clothes, you know, like a bed sheet, uh, escape, yep. uh, thing. And then rope. there's also, 
my belt if if somehow I can work my belt into the the outfit so that I don't know if that's going to make 50 feet that might make I don't know eight or ten feet tops probably more like six or eight but uh and then I will the the well if I mean Alfred Smalls is a big man maybe his size can work for him in that maybe if I use if I climb down the first few rungs and then I just kind of put my back into the into the the other part of the well my sheer girth might actually work almost like a cork in a wine bottle like I might be able to kind of do a controlled a controlled thing where I'm not sort of going to go ah and fall down the well just because I'm too rotund so I might be able to kind of lean into the back of the well and just let my sheer bulk uh as I'm kind of using the you know kind of holding down the sure. the, the makeshift uh, clothing let's begin uh, with the rope yes let's, let's begin, begin with, with the that. rope yes November 1931 is kind to few, least of all the little guys caught between the cold shoreline, the crummy breadline, and the frontline violence of mobsters and G-men. Every day, the news is so bad that people don't even want to line their clothes or shoes with the papers that report it. But the chill talks them into it. Maybe if they live one more day, it might be work. Although the suffering and the violence are getting worse every day, the papers take any opportunity to write about something else. Scandals, gangsters, socialists and socialites. Hundreds of small fry jump or get jumped every night. But if one rich guy stumbles, Using Alfred Small's prodigious intelligence to concoct this plan, he is then forced to fall back on his dexterity to execute it. So begin oh, yeah. with tying the knots. Now the trousers, if you are to take one leg as up and the other leg is down, that is a six foot span almost by itself. And then the belt. Good Lord, man, the belt. Yes. It's like a, it's like the equator. <laughs> yes. And, and the coat, you know, so it's, it's worth doing. It's possible that it could reach down far enough. If Terrence can climb high enough that maybe it could be helpful or maybe you will have to position yourself and try to leverage your way down the inside of the well at great risk to any below. <laughs> the concern is will the stitching hold under the weight of a desperate man below? And maybe that will fall to luck. 
Dexterity check, please. Right. One more dice. Uh, is this dexterity times five, or how, what should yes. I? Okay. Five. Okay. So I have a dexterity of twelve. So twelve times five is sixty. Let's see Almost what we always. Get. Oh, 95. Uh, I'm I'm too nervous. I'm a nervous too wreck. Nervous. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, the, the sleeves, the heavy wool keeps unraveling and, and, and there's splashing and thrashing and burbling. There's lots of water sounds from down below. All right. Uh, in addition to everything else. But as the frustration rises, right, in that cold shock of adrenaline, Is there an argument happening somewhere? It almost sounds like two people are, are arguing. Do I know the voices? It's, it's too distant. Argument. So it sounds like somebody out outside the, the well, the well, the outbuilding. Maybe as far away as the house. You know. Wow. Okay. That's not good. Uh, all right. So now I'm in my s small clothes, pardon the pun, uh, because I've tried to put together this elaborate uh, rope ladder for, uh, or clothing ladder for Terrence. That's not working. So I'm, I, there's no time. Terrence. Yeah. The water is rising. Right. Okay. The remaining rung is a full stretch overhead. Yeah. It will soon be tread water or right. Or leap. Um, I'm I'm trying to trying to see if I can do anything. If I can reach that rung, if I can use the old rung to kind of catch on to it, you know, something. Even <laughs> even if I. You know, having the same idea that that Smalls was having, you know, except with a, a smaller frame. Even if I can brace myself, some way I can get up to that max prong. You know, so I'm pretty much desperately trying to do whatever I can as as my clothes are getting heavier. And uh, you know, this is a dexterity check, so that's dexterity multiplied by five. Okie dokie. Well, let's see. Forty-five. Unfortunate. That was a 64. Okay. So it's just out of reach. And then when you try the rung, right, it pulls out that that last one. So I, I duck. <laughs> so not get not get hit by the other rung. Okay. And it is it is cold water, and it's vile water. It's it's not clean well water. It's like swamp water, right? And there's this rising smell of rotted, matted vegetable matter and other things, best not described. I really just don't want to get my head underneath that. So I'm, I'm just. Still, just kind of desperately trying to trying to tread water, trying to get myself up. Anyway, I can't. Something bumps your leg. All right. At this point, okay. It's, I, I don't think that's that's wrong. That's probably just probably just the body. Okay. Oh, the body. Oh. Oh. Smalls. Hang, hang on, Terrence. I'm coming, and I will. Uh, what? Uh, <laughs> yeah, suddenly the, the sunlight is eclipsed a little bit at the top of the well as is still in his small clothes. Uh uh he will he will lever himself over the edge of the, the lip of the well. All right. And uh try to do it in, in such a way that most of his weight is pressed up against the opposite wall because he's none too uh confident in these iron rungs seeing that uh, several of them have have already mm -hmm. fallen out so he'll just 
clumsily try to clump his way down as best he can. He'll bring his belt if he can to try to kind of hero, you know, kind of hold on, hold the, the belt down so that maybe sure. Terrence can make some use of it. I don't know. This and, is uh, another check of dexterity, but this one is <laughs> harder, my friend. This is dexterity times three. All right, that's going to be a 36. So. Oh, a 17. Okay. The first moment is the hardest. Letting go of this lip so that your back can go against that wall. But with a meaty clap, you make contact with the cold stone. But do you have the strength to keep yourself here and lower yourself down? Ah, that is Small's true Achilles heel. He has a strength of four. So four so times with your 20% five. chance. Yes. As you begin descent. the descent. <laughs> All right, here we go. Oh, 82. All right. As long as you don't move, you can keep your legs locked. But any movement, and you're going to fall. And the edge of the well is out of reach everywhere and your legs are starting to shake terence i'm stuck i don't know what to do what get, get yourself for the love of god man don't fall on me just get yourself back up there get the hell out of the well can you, can you grab the wrong or something? I mean, what do you, what do you mean you're stuck? What? The, the, gravity. It's, it's too much. You can hear people coming through the grass. Shh. There are even footsteps of people walking. And there are arrhythmic footsteps. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 dun. And then All right. the shadows move across the ceiling of the well house, presumably as someone comes in the door and violently, forcefully, the head, shoulders, right, and face of Tommy or Reardon. Right. As his belly slams into the lip of the well, he folds over the top of the well, his hat tumbling down to land on your belly, right. his hair all disheveled, right. and he just blurts out, Smalls! Hello! And then he's pulled out of view. And Jimmy, or James, as his wife would prefer, looks down in. Says, well, I wouldn't have expected to see that. We seem to have run into a bit of a problem. As you can see, all is not well. I, uh, T Terrence is below me, and, uh, he got himself into a problem, and then I thought I could make a rope ladder out of my clothes, and that wasn't working, and then I tried to climb down to save him, but now I'm stuck. Maybe you and, uh, maybe you and young Tommy could help out 
but uh, oh, and Terrence, there's water coming in. I don't know how you're holding up, Terrence. What's going on down there? I'm gonna die here. Could you can you get get out of the way? <laughs> well, Reardon is clearly struggling to get to the lip of the well. You can see his hands every now and again, and sometimes you know the his forehead or the top. You know, someone is restraining him that you can't see. And you know the the cabbie is just occasionally looking down, and there's there's voices, there's a, a conversation. The cabbie, is he looking, uh, is he, is his face in sort of a villainous cast now? Is he sort of looking down with a smirk and a kind of a, I mean, it, it, it's obvious he's not, he and Tommy are not working together to help two people he get out of a well. He doesn't look like he's motivating himself to think of a way out of your predicament. Yeah. Hmm. Uh. And then there is a voice. Alfred, you've not heard this voice before, but Terrence, you have. The last time it spoke to you, it told you to sleep, to be at peace. And the voice says, Oh, Mr. Smalls, I'm sorry that we were delayed so long in arriving here, and that you've put yourself in peril for your dear friend and fellow servant. We will endeavor to free you from this terrible trap and hope that time remains to rescue Mr. McSweeney before the waters close over his head. But do not worry, Mr. McSweeney. Even if the waters take you, your service to me will continue and you can fulfill your purpose. I don't think I'm so good to you dead. Hang in there, Terrence. We're, we're going to get out of here one way or the other. Could uh, oh. someone help us out of this well? So Smalls' coat. Is drop down and the voice continues you're going to hold on to this coat very good i want you to close your eyes and hold on to the coat it's just soothing melodious voice Close your eyes and hold on to the coat. And we will begin to climb one step, another step. And before you know it, your feet settle down on the floor outside the well. Wonderful. Amazing. Now, Terrence, from your point of view, Smalls literally floated out of the well. Boy, that was the strangest thing I've ever seen. I'm just glad he's out of the well. I see blessed sunlight one more time. And standing in front of you, Alfred Smalls, is a man of 
average height. Very unusual face, clean shaven, but tattooed across the face are strange symbols. Very well dressed, looking out of place in this rustic environment. Although where such a person would look at home is hard to imagine. Is Alfred Smalls, as you get dressed, I would like you to consider the choice that lies before you. And what would that be? To embrace destiny or to reject it. To transcend to new life or to wither away into death. This is the choice. This is the cusp of the choice on which you stand right there. You have begun to understand the book and its passenger. You have yet to open yourself fully, and I need you to do so. And if you do not, your life will become even more miserable than it already is. And your friend Terence will die horribly. Well then, <laughs> that is really no choice. I choose life for my friend Terence, and I choose to ride fate, whatever it might bring to me. I'm a man who meets his fate, whatever that may be. I'm glad. And very formally, in a non-threatening way, he holds out his hands to, like a in a fraternal order, embrace and welcome you into the fold, if you will accept. I, I will. I'll not push him away or make any resistance. No. He smells like fine talcum powder like cinnamon. He steps back. South and Smalls, array yourself in your garments. The book must meet the book. And we will descend into the Scots secret chambers below, which you have been so Excellent in finding, Terence. I knew when fate brought you to me that you would have great value and you have not disappointed. Okay, how about show, show some appreciation? I'd like to get out of here before I freeze to death or drown. Calm yourself. Where did the water come from? There's a, there's a grade I moved this as a passage beyond that. Or something. Fill your lungs with air. Swim through the passage. Do not falter or you will die. On the other side, you will find air, you will be in darkness, and there will be a mechanism. The mechanism will drain the water and we will come to join you. And I suppose you're not going to let, help me get out of here otherwise. No. What good is a tool if it disobeys the master's hand?
I regret this. So I take a deep breath. It's kind of feel like where the pet where the where the opening is serves to make sure I really know where it is. Take a couple deep breaths to kind of get as much air as I possibly can in my lungs. <laughs> Looking down this fetid water and, and finally just taking the plunge and, and kicking off the other side of the wall to see if I can actually feel they're, they're pretty panicked at this point. Okay. More than anything else, this is an act of will. I suppose it is. This is power. Power. All right. I call it ever. No, it didn't get restored. Any, did not lose a couple of points of that already. Two. Two. All right. So, so, so we're looking at fifty-five. I think. Why did I do that video about no chances? That is a 20. And wait, wait, I'm looking for the other die because it's not on the floor, but it's a single. That is a 26. Did you expect somehow the second die to take it over 55? No, no. Still, <laughs> I wanted to be honest. 26. Now, as Terrence is working himself up below, right? You can hear the charging of, of air in the lungs, and movement of the water, Alfred. A second tattooed faced gentleman has entered the space. But this man, his eyes are just white. There is no iris, no pupil. And as he comes in, he is holding up Alfred's coat and and dusting it off. He's making sure that Alfred is steady on his feet while pulling on his trousers. He's simply there to lend a hand. Thank you. Much appreciated. Well, Reardon is in the corner of the room unwillingly. There's no person there holding him back and yet he is restrained. Jimmy or James is casually sitting on the edge of the well. Um, <clears throat> the uh, Tommy uh, uh, Mr. O'Reardon here is a uh, something of a, a friendly acquaintance of mine. Uh, perhaps, Tommy, if you agree not to uh, uh, act uh, aggressively, uh, whatever these uh, bonds are that hold you uh, could be could be released. I'd look. Uh, Look over at the uh, tattooed people. Uh, uh, sort of raise my eyebrow. Like maybe uh, we could all be uh, civilized and uh, and just uh, rely on uh, uh, gentlemanliness to keep us in check. Well, what say, Tommy? The Man with no irises, no expression crosses his face. The man who has been speaking is as curious as you are of what Will Reardon's answer will be. Which is, if you hurt him, Tommy, uh, uh, calm down, friend. Calm down. Uh, 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 no good can come from rashness. No good can come from anger right now. Please, I'll, I'll kind of I'll walk over now that I'm all clothed up again. Uh, I, I, Smalls will walk over across its short distance and 
put a almost uh you know just a a, a kindly hand on on tommy's shoulder and kind of kind of with his eyes almost try to communicate like please just you know we, we're we're in a very we're we're in some place really weird like let's just let's not poke any bears so and the only comment from your captors are just oh the fires of youth do you remember how they burned alfred may i call you alfred oh um, uh, yeah, certainly certainly and uh uh, uh i'll turn back uh, what may i call you Master, if you like, or uh, Mr. Morgan. Mr. Morgan, ah, very good, very good, yes. Ah, uh, you still have some fiery youth in you, let me yet, Mr. Smalls. Uh, we never truly lose ourselves. We just add more layers. The water. is not as bad beneath the surface as it is above the surface. For you are blind and holding your breath, cannot see it nor smell it, but you can feel it and other things sliding across your face, sliding into and under your shirt. And it is long, your lungs are burning, your heart is pounding in your ears until you reach the point where the body will breathe. You're driven to the surface and break into darkness. I'm breathing as much as I can, looking for, I mean, just with my arms feeling over anything, it looks like I might be able to crawl out of this. And you can. In fact, there are rough cut stairs. I thought I'd just pull myself up desperately. They're uh, uh, like a crescent shape, like on the front of a stage or podium or something quite wide. Right. Yeah, curving, curving away from me. Right. Yeah. Right. I'm trying to pull myself up on, on, on that. And, you know, so it's pitch black. So I'm really just. Just put it my hand and feeling everything. Right. And it's freezing, and I'm just looking, feeling around for a mechanism. So I'm like the really. The only slowly. sound is the water dripping and draining out of your clothes. The air smells stale, and the only movement is you right. stirring up these clouds of. Then you feel cold metal and gears. And so I'm going to start to kind of feel on those fields that I can feel anything that looks like it's a lever or some kind of control or wheel or anything like that. Yeah. There, there is kind of a wheel, a large metal wheel. All right, and yeah. so I'm just going to pull it clockwise, counterclockwise, see if there's a way that, like, it seems to, you know, be, be stuck or, or, you know, have, find an end in another way. That... Yeah, and you get it in motion. Right? And it's squealing with disuse. Yeah. And you hear the sound of the water beginning to drain. So, yeah, I'm just going to lay down on my back at this point, try to get my, get my breath back and my bearings back. And, and I probably still have a candle on me, but whatever matches I have are completely ruined. And, you know, like my heavy, wet clothes, sort of, you know, frigidly clean, you know, checking to see if I still have both shoes. But here, in the deprivation of darkness, behind your eyes, it's harder to hide away 
from the sense of Gavigan. Do I, do I hear At, him or is it just... You feel him falling. You feel him screaming. Tied to you like to nothing else in life. At the top of the well, the sound of the water and the level of the water begins to recede. Thank heavens. He's done it. He has. And now, I believe, the lungs can be trusted. Um, so you would like for us all to travel down to, uh, to where Terence is, uh, at the moment? I understand that this is not the sort of environment where you would normally comport yourself. And if we, or if you had found the formal way in, we would certainly go that way. Time is pressing. We have an appointment with destiny. We have an appointment with your friend, Ludwig Cream. Uh, well, that's a name that we've become acquainted with. Uh, all right, then. Fair enough. Let's, um, let's head down this well. We must first test it for safety, and you, my dear Alpha, you are not expendable in this matter. Just send your, send your boy. All right, I'll look to Jimmy White, and I'll say, how about you go, boy? Feisty. <laughs> Jimmy stands up off the well, adjusts his collar, pats you on the shoulder, and says, I'm already dead. What does it matter? Curls his legs over the edge of the well and starts climbing down the rungs. Such a conversational person. You can keep no secrets that you need. Curiouser and curiouser. Well, if fate is down below, then fate is where we shall go. And uh, Jimmy's voice comes up from below and says, There are several rungs missing. It's a bit of a stretch. Must have been quite a surprise for the reporter. So be careful or not. And then he reaches the bottom. All right. Mr. Smalls, now we've reached the point where we don't need Mr. R. Reardon. Would you like him to accompany you? Well, I would like for Mr. Or Reardon to be the master of his own fate in this. If he chooses I'll go to with walk you. away... Oh. Tommy, that's, that's very brave of you. I don't know what lay, lies below. Oh. It, I hate to bring you further into this predicament. I'm not leaving you alone with this, this yeah. world. Words fail the 18 year old. Yeah. He doesn't want to swear in your presence. Right. All right. I'll pat Tommy on the, on the shoulder. And he will and... follow Jimmy down. Okay. 
as he's going down, I'll shoot a look to Mr. Morgan, Boss Morgan, Master Morgan. I've taken a liking to that young man. He's only 18. Perhaps you don't remember a time when you were 18 and weren't so steeped in all these secrets that you seem to have. But I am fond of him. And if I have a part to play in this, and he comes to harm, well, I'd rather that not happen. I have no designs on his life, and every knight needs a squire, and he seems a fine one. His life is in your hands. And is all. Thank you. Well, we've reached the point now where you must descend. But if you fall and you die, then I have no need to go down there. Truthfully, I fear gravity more than you. But my friend Terence is already down there, as is young Mr. Tommy O'Rick. So it is my turn. I go. And he'll hike up his courage, <laughs> um, take stock of his bones that are not broken, and, you know, just... Uh, and this down. descent is in the hands of destiny, of fate, of luck. Okay. Uh, well, let's see if luck is a lady. If it's a... <laughs> oh, 59 off of 60. <laughs> the descent is perilous. Some rungs shift. Some, your smooth shoe leather shoots off to the side. And then there's the gaps, helpfully provided by Terence's exploration, requiring you to descend, stretch your leg down, down, down. Where is the other rung until finally you find yourself? at the bottom with the disturbed, scattered bones of whoever it was who died down there. And Tommy O'Reardon and the cab driver. Terrence, Terrence, can you hear us? We're down here now. Echo. Yeah, yeah, I can I can hear you, Smalls. You, you made it down okay, huh? I did. Good God. <laughs> and I'm laughing in spite of myself, in spite of everything. Yeah, so I just have this, like, nervous... <laughs> Relief. <laughs> you made it down in the bottom. <laughs> Uh, well, if you could just keep laughing, we'll follow the sound of your voice. <laughs> now, <laughs> the cab driver is standing, you know, arms crossed with this huge grin on his face, and he's looking at O'Reardon, and O'Reardon has been trying to, like, make eye contact with you, like, we can get this guy. <laughs> Put another reassuring pat on uh, Tommy's shoulder, like there's a time for everything. I don't know, Mister Smalls. I think the time has passed. Coming down the ladder is the the leaner silhouette of the taller gentleman with no eyes. All right. 
make way for him. He reaches the bottom, stands next to you, brushes a little bit of material from his shoulder of your coat. And then Morgan begins his descent. You hear that, Gavigan? Smalls made it all the way down. <laughs> Terrence is talking to Gavigan? Smalls' valise, his case, is in the right hand of Morgan. When he reaches the bottom, he passes it over. Thank you. Our journey is for naught if we leave this above. Mm. Come then gentlemen. Lead the way. Hmm, yes, the tunnel. lead the way. So Jimmy, definitely seeming more like a Jimmy than a James, gets down on hands and knees and crawls through the, the iron grate, uh, but seems to be soon able to stand up once on the other side. Just a, a brief moment of crawling. And Morgan is eyeing Smalls and eyeing the iron entrance. <laughs> Does it look uh, big enough to accept Smalls' uh, passage? With some effort and possibly some skin. Okay. Well, he'll give it the old college try. So with help from behind and before, <laughs> yep. Smalls can straighten up inside this corridor. All right. And once on his feet, then Jimmy flicks a match. And Terrence, you can see a thin glimmer of light down the passage that you must have swum through. Yeah. When everyone's assembled on the other side of the grate, then Morgan winks at Alfred Smalls. Says, Tell me, Mr. Smalls. Claps his hand. Do you believe in magic? He reveals his palms. There's light. Well, that's a neat trick. And he gestures, and these wisps of light begin to float down the tunnel. Must be some sort of phosphorus gas. Must be. Guess we'll uh, we'll begin our march, uh, following the lights. The lights lead into a wide opening to the right part of the the natural stone of this cavern has been carved. You find, yeah, you know, Terence is there. There are risers or stairs, right, uh, curved like arrayed for like singers or for a presentation or, or something like that. Not a straight staircase, but you know, a nice scalloped shape rising up to a not perfectly flat, but you know, treated stone entry floor. And this cavern, for a cavern it is, right, descends far into darkness with many 
pillars coming down, many of which have been carved into grotesque shapes. Quite the place. I liked it better when it was dark. <laughs> oh, Terrence. Come, Smalls. I have waited for your meeting for so long. Come, Terrence. Bring Darren in if you like. I get up with so like heavy, so <laughs> stinking wet, cold clothes. Sloshing over. What else? He moves between the pillars, coming to another opening where there is, for lack of a better word, an altar, also intricately carved with writhing roots and branches or some other form of more animal life. But in the dim, almost ethereal illumination of these wisps of light that are moving slowly around him, almost in orbit, the details are always obscured by shadow. But it also makes the look like the altar is a block of snakes writhing and twisting and intertwining with each other as the shadows play across the surface. You, gentlemen, are a nexus point of time and space. You are connections made manifest that were never made. Through my workings, I have banished the younger Davigan to this place. Him holding the true book, which I desire. Knew it. Well, you also hold the true book. And this is a mystery that only you could bring to solution. So what now? You do some sort of ceremony? What's, uh, what's the end game here, Mr. Morgan? You desire this book. It's bound to Mr. Gavigan. And yet somehow it's also bound to me. You wish to possess it for yourself. I must warn you, this book chooses who it, cho who it wishes to associate with. Uh, despite your obvious mastery of certain sciences that elude my understanding, you may yet be tampering with something that even you cannot control. I would be wary of my own fate if I were you. And I say that really, not as a threat, but as an observation. He leans in really close, right? Not breaking the bounds of personal space, but he leans in really close and intently, right? To say, without risk, there is no life. But if you risk too much, you forfeit your life. But I have tasted so sweetly of things. You live above the wreckage of other people's lives. How can you school me on the risks I should take or the passions I should experience? If my full life has come to an end, then so be it. I will possess the secrets of print. And Queen shall possess you.
I say this not as an antagonist, but merely as an observer to your your designs. Uh, I can only reiterate that you wish to possess something that has ghosted down through the centuries. Something that was created during the Crusades. Something that predates, I suspect, your life. I would not be so sure that I had every angle figured out. I think you're about to step, uh, acknowledging that risk, you're about to step into another realm if you think you can control what this book uh, has and its secrets. It's, uh, I, I, I just, I think you're dealing with things that, that I, I mean this. I mean this with no heat. But uh, despite all your ambition and your desire and your hubris, uh, uh, this your 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 attainment of whatever it is you're looking for, uh, it is it is not assured. Uh, I, I say this again, not to, not as a not as a foe, but simply as someone who has been brought in to something that I don't know much about, but I know enough, I've seen enough to know that what we're about to do, what you're about to do, well, it's very, very uncertain. So I would think long before you, you proceed. That is all I, and that is all I, I can say at this time. During this time, I'm taking out of the, my coat pocket, this ruined notepad, and I'm just looking at it and put it back in the coat pad, you know, and I, was, and I can't write anything down. It's just ridiculous. Listen. Can you hear it? And you can. That step drag sound. drawing closer, going louder. And in the dim and weird whitish blue light flickering through this cavern, Albert Gavigan's brutalized body shreds through the air like minced meat through the butcher's grinder in streamers and runnels to reform whole but for his leg before you as if being dragged across the rough stone floor until he collapses in a crying heap clutching tightly to the pages of Ludwig Prinz's Mysteries of the Worm. The coverless pages. Good heavens. Um, Something that you cannot see is dragging him. It is its heavy steps that you hear and Gavigan's writhing body that drags. Just horrified. I'm going to give this scene a wide berth. Horrified, indeed. Terence also. Sixty-three. Twenty-four off of fifty-six. In the back of your mind, Mr. Smalls, 
is no lack of surprise at such things. And that calm acceptance is like a buffer between you and the horror of the scene. But Terence, your dreams were real all along. And over the past few days, this man has been calling out to you to save him. Gavigan, there's nothing I could do. What do you want me to do? God. Is the thing that's pulling him leaving any kind of footprints, anything in the muck to give any indication of its size or form? Here, it's, it's stone, and there's a lot of shadow, particularly around your legs and... and uh, because the, the light is from above and casting shadows everywhere. But the way that Gavigan's body jerks is like a child pulling a little red wagon, as if the weight is negligible. And then his body is allowed to collapse fully on the stone and the steps move into the darkness. Step, step. Um, fish go ahead. Uh, I was gonna fish around in my coat pocket, see if I still have that little ineffectual pistol. It's gone. No idea whether I brought it with me or not, or even whether it's survived all those misadventures. I'm going to take a look over, just glance over at Morgan and Jimmy and the blind tattooed guy. Are they, we've all, we're obviously all in the presence of some thing that we can't see they're least, waiting least... for you to find your feet so as it were okay they're waiting for you to come to terms with what has happened okay so they're not recoiling from this monster or anything or this invisible creature they're not they're not bedazzled or, or horrified they're just taking it as matter of course okay Maybe a look of wonder on Jimmy's face and a look of abject horror on O'Reardon's face. Yep. He's looking at you. He's looking at Gavigan. He's looking at you. He's looking at Gavigan. He's, he needs to act. He wants to act. He doesn't know to fight or flee. He's trapped in right. his own skin in the darkness of this cavern. Steady. Steady, Thomas. Focus on our breathing, huh? We're here. We'll see this through. There's another big bag of donuts waiting for us at the end of all this. He's not crying, but he's close. And he laughs, but he's also weeping in the same moment. He's gripping your arm so tight. As with all things, there is a price. As with all things, the price is blood. As with all things, the time to pay is now. Smalls, the book has chosen you. The sorcerer crusader Ludwig Prin has chosen you. The time has come to rest the book from the grip 
of the pretender and return it to proper keeping. <clears throat> All right. Smalls will slowly walk towards Gavigan. His and I've eyes got are clouded own. with pain. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I've got my valise, uh, which I believe has the the book. The book. Uh, yeah. And before I open the valise, I'm uh, going to put my hand on Gavigan's shoulder. I'll lean in to him and say, Mr. Gavigan, my name is Alfred Smalls. I'm but a mere shopkeeper who has been pulled into this mystery. You have a part of the Book of the Worm. I seemingly have a part of the book of the worm. I don't know if I, I it's not my place to take despite the assertions of this person over here. I'm not going to force those pages from your fingers any more than I believe you could by force remove what I carry with me. Truly, let us let the book decide how it wishes to resolve things. Perhaps if we both trust one another, let's bring our, our parcels, put them together, and see what the book chooses. Uh, it might be the best way out of this. What say you, Mr. Gavigan? As you're close, face to face, in the weird darkness and light of this cavern, whatever intelligence Gavigan possessed in his life before this experience, it's hard to tell if any remains. Writhing in pain, his face distorted, holding so tightly to the book. But your words have a calming effect. And the valise moves. All right. I'll unclasp the hasp. I'll unfasten the hasp and gingerly uh, reach in and pull out our copy of the book. His eyes rivet to it. He's holding on for dear life. A man who's been falling for days is holding on to the one thing. Let's try to work together, Mr. Gavigan. I'll hold out. I'll hold out my copy. Uh, bring yours forward as well. One either... arm begins to flail around. Okay. To grip or grab anything. I'll put up my own hand. I can't. I, it's killing me to see him in such pain and fright. If it means I get pulled down the pit too, so be it. But he won't go alone. So I'll. Smalls will put his own arm out, his own fleshy arm, and just maybe that human contact will be an help. You know, your hands join together, not in any neat or organized way, but just in that clumsy way of, of flailing, gripping hands. He's holding on as tight as he can, and it's sadly weakened. His hand is cold and trembling, but he's gripping as tightly as he can. 
Right? And then he pulls himself up Small's arm. He pulls himself up your arm to fold himself into an embrace. I'll the embrace the book scatter onto the cold stone floor of the cave. All right, I I will embrace him. I'm not going to 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 cut that short. He needs he needs the contact. So, I'll give it give it that time. And then uh see it will maybe he comes to his senses, maybe he doesn't, but let's give him that moment. And then there's a clearing of the throat. Jimmy, maybe. Huh. And Terrence, where there were pages and book and valise, now there's valise and book. That's normal. And the chewing sound of pages finally stops. Son of a bitch. I'm just looking up at, at uh, Mr. Morgan, or X as I probably know him, and just, so that it's looking at what his, you know, what is his reaction to all this? He's just waiting. Next, next to him is the taller, leaner right, man with no eyes. Their faces pale, unnaturally pale in the mysterious light that's still drifting around. How um how old does this mechanism look now that I can see it? Gears and rough framework. I mean it could date back to the beginning of the age of steam. Who knows? How how sturdy when I was, you know, turning it before, how sturdy is it? This is a heavy metal yeah. contraption of big yeah. cogs and gears and pipes and things. Yeah. Not easily broken. It's too bad. But the gun is in your pocket. Whether it will fire is another question. Yeah. Yeah, so... um. I'm gonna, I'm gonna open the wheel back up and fire at the trying to break it in the open position. <laughs> okay. So you move over to the wheel and okay, it's not a quick moving wheel. No. That's my ultimate intention. Whether that happens or not. I'm sorry. Terrence, what are you doing? I think this is going on far enough, Morgan. I think maybe these things ought to be left left where they are. Ah, heroism. Sorry, me. Go ahead. So I'm stopping at that point. Yeah. Terrence, I do want you to live. But as I mentioned, you will continue either way. Mr. Smalls, it is time. Please, if you would, lie down on 
the altar. All right, I'm going to give him a sort of a quizzical look. And then I'm going to scoop up, not, not hurriedly, just kind of slowly scoop up the book. Don't want you getting all soiled on this nasty floor. Gavin can Gavigan himself kind of relaxes back right, into all right. what's going to become a, a fetal position. Right. Uh, I'll see if I can get uh, Tommy. Maybe you could uh, help this man. Uh, I'll try to kind of, kind of, you know, kind of get him over from because I'm trying to. Get get the book, and then I've got Gavigan, so I'm trying to maybe get Gavigan Reardon comes over, in to to help re, yes, reposition, right? Reposition. The man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and it also gives Tommy something to focus on, someone to focus on. You know, like with all his energy and all his kinetic whatever, it's like okay, now we can kind of focus on keeping this guy steady, right. upright. Um, and then I'm going to. Uh, I'm the book is whisper. warm in your hands. Yeah. I'm going to whisper to the book. I'm going to say, do you wish to be a slave to this man? I don't think you do. If you have any tricks that you can pull, and I've seen some of the tricks that you've been able to pull, you've got anything in your pages that could help, well, yourself as well as we fools that have been pulled into this web. Now would be a wonderful time. And then I'll look up at uh, I'll look up at uh, uh, Morgan and I'll uh, say, uh, you know, you may not be the only being in this room that wishes to possess this book. Uh, I look off the sound of the feet, the sound of the, cl the, 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 whatever that thing was that pulled Gavigan from someplace and into this space. I'll sort of call out to that shadowy corner and say, I don't know if you're even still here. I don't know if you have a pot to play in all this any more than, I don't know if you are uh, free willed or yourself a servant, but, uh, I wonder if you too have a stake in all of this. And then I'll look back to Morgan. I'll say, you may be contesting with something very different than a, a shopkeeper and a, and a fighter. I'll nod over to young Tommy and a, a newspaper reporter. And then I'll, uh, kind of whisper to the book like I'm trying to buy you some time here book if you've got any ideas and then I'll, I'll move over to the altar with the book and uh Morgan is patiently waiting with a smile right a friendly smile okay I'm going to lay the book down on the altar I'm not going to lay down on the altar myself. I'm going to place the book on the altar and I'm going to let it open, you know, like I'll, I'll, I'll almost like a, like a, a book that, that, that has been thumbed through. If you lay it down with it's sometimes it'll like, it'll fall open to a frequently accessed passage or page. I'm going to and see if the X falls open and the others behind your bulk can't really see how the pages adjust themselves. All right. And I will look down at the pages to which it has opened. And, and I'm hoping that it has some, something that I can almost by intuition. Uh, I, if it's a spell or if it's a summoning or if it's a, this or a that, it might instruct me. Otherwise, uh, it, it if it if it it's a gambit. Who knows, right? Uh, it might just be a random series of pages, and this is this is about to go another way. I don't know. But um, at this point, what the hell, right? Let's see what it 
what it has and if there's anything any sort of incantation or language or what what not uh or we'll give it a go on the left hand leaf in the fine script is again a series of poetical lines on the right hand leaf is an anatomical sketch of a man arms raised and that posture forms an identical shape to the central tattoo on Morgan's forehead, like a three-lobed Y. And the book right. is pulsing. All right, I'm, I'm with you. I whisper to it, and then I, uh, I'll, I'll make that with my own body. I will stand like in, like a priestly, you know, priestly. Uh, attitude uh, with the book on the altar opened up and myself making the uh, the, the, the 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 figure the, on the page what the hell is he doing okay okay Hey. Uh, let's see. So power is 12. 12 times 5 is 60. Let's see what happens. Oh. 93. <laughs> the words stumble you can feel something building inside but it is frustrated in its attempt to make its way out and something is frustrated in its attempt to make its way in and All morgan right. kindly and gently steps forward reaching out to place his hand on on your back in a convivial way Valiant effort. Your heart fills me with such hope. But please, let me show you how it's done. All right, I'll give him a look like, uh, all right, if you want to give it a go. And then uh, as I'm stepping to the side, I'm going to give uh, the, the book mm -hmm. itself a stage like a, a theatrical wink. <laughs> Mr. Smalls, please. Why that? <laughs> all right. Uh, gonna look at Terrence like, all right, well, here goes everything. Um, all right, I'm going to pick up the book because the book is on the altar. And I'm going to lay on the uh, altar, but I'm going to hold the book. Uh, and uh, just sort of have if, it on my... Like this, if you would. All right. Yep, I'll do that. And when you're comfortable, you make sure that you're comfortable. It helps adjust <laughs> your coat. Sure, sure. Right? Yep. Mm -hmm. he says, now, first, Mr. Smalls, remember that there are always consequences. Of course. Be mindful of I, that yourself. In all things that I do. Well, you'll know Reardon's life is now forfeit. I'll take it when I choose. 
I believe that's a bit of a reneging on our, uh, our earlier conversation at the top of the uh, top of the well. You knew it. That's uh, that's moving the goalposts, as they say. I'm sorry you feel that way. Perhaps when we have freed Prin from the book and released him into your vast vessel, you can alter our deal. Well, you've already altered it, and I'm going to get up off the altar and say, <clears throat> nope. You promised that young Mr. Orridden would have his own life, make his own way. Now you're saying you're going to claim it. <clears throat> if you did as I bid, can you well, not tell me that you've been trying to unleash some unholy terror to free yourself and your companions from my grasp? Well, I suppose I have, but uh, I don't necessarily uh, remember so you forbidding us for that. Ooh. I mean, the letter of uh, you've you've we've done everything you've bid. Uh, I've gotten to this point. But, uh, no, it, it's, uh, I don't, I don't feel that we've, uh, I don't feel that we've actually, uh, you know, the book is going, to, haven't I been trying to tell you that this book is going to do exactly what this book wants to do when it wants to do it? Yes, and that's what I wanted to do. Well, fine. Fine, fine then, but none of this business of young Mr. Tommy here being pulled into your, under, you know, put put under a yoke to which you hold the the controls. No, none of that, no. I'm not I'm going to go through with it. Sorry for having upset you. Well, you have, you have, and I, but, <clears throat> all right, very well. Uh, uh, if we're still under the agreement that Tommy is free, then I'll go along with your designs. All right. Well, Reardon will not pay the price. Uh, uh, very good. Very good. Please. All right. Okay. <clears throat> Get back, back, back on the altar. Get myself all settled in. Still got the book. The man with no irises comes over, and from beneath his coat, he produces a flat knife. In a strange color, etched with strange symbols, which Morgan takes. All right. And Morgan begins to speak. The words almost slither out of his mouth and down his chest and across smalls and around the book as he speaks, coiling and oiling their way into the cracks and the crevices. And his arms are rising, the knife in hand. Uh, get an eye on that knife. <laughs> I'm holding the book. So my idea is if he brings that knife down in any kind of a sacrificial gesture, I'm actually going to move the book so that he attempts to, you know, essentially so that he would be stabbing the book, if at all possible, since I want to parry or block with the book itself. Right. And your assumption is correct as his... Words reach a crescendo, his hands join together overhead, and he begins to bring the knife down. 
All right. Slide that book right in the way. Now, or Reardon is breaking away from Gavigan to to run, you know, reaching out to interpose himself. Terrence? Terrence is going to shoot this bastard. <laughs> or at least try to. Okay. And the book. I'll save the defense with the book for the last moment. Okay. We'll begin with the gunshot. Uh, that's a four zero. Which let me just double check. I don't think that's very good. Oh no, it's not good at all. Yes. <laughs> Bang. The although he is chanting this entire time, the cavern is quiet. Like your echoes, his incantation does not echo. The words are flowing where the words will flow. And the fact that you can hear them is because they are touching you. But all of that is shattered by a gunshot. <laughs> or Reardon lunges across the altar. The knife is descending. Block. Yep. All right. So what am I rolling to? Fist. Fist. All right. Oh, four. Okay. Smalls the pugilist. My God. Oh, four. Yep. The ships are down. throws himself across Smalls lower body. Right. That's as far as you can get tripped up by the illusory surface of the of the altar. The book impacts with the knife. The knife digging into the cover. And there's a cold flash. The knife is gone. The book is gone. The knife is gone. The book is gone. Terrence is standing with gun outstretched. Alfred Smalls is across the altar a reardon is across smalls morgan standing with arms upstretched brings them down and says what will be will be this bastard's crazy <laughs> and he paying no mind to the deprecation of character levied by Terrence and his blind associate and Jimmy walk off into the darkness. You can find your own way out. Are they walking towards the well or off into the cavern further? Into the cavern. Jeez, let's get the hell out of here. They're taking the light with them. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's go, Smalls. Let's go. Right, right, right. Uh, 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 Tommy, uh, let's let's get stuff to get Gavigan. And so, Terrence McSweeney, Alfred Smalls, Albert Gavigan, and Tommy are reared and climb up out of darkness into the dying light of a cold November afternoon. And the first investigation for Turn of a New Leaf comes to a close. We live to see. I guess uh, I'll, I'll 
I kind of turn to my compadres here. I'll say, well, we, uh, we live to see another day. And I believe there's a cab waiting for us. No, there's no cab waiting for us, for God's sake, Smalls. If you don't mind, can we build a fire first? <sighs> fine, fine. Uh... Oh, that was wonderful. All right. All right. But, All right. Uh, <laughs> All right. Thank you Build very much fire. for playing, gentlemen. Fantastic. 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 That was a hoot. Yeah. Now uh, we've got uh, we've got mysteries upon mysteries. The book is gone or transported somewhere. Yeah. With treating it lot. like a campaign, I put things in that don't have any particular bearing on an investigation per se but that you're free to act upon or not as uh, as play continues right no i love it it's a sandbox and it's uh we've got these uh i don't know if we want to call them enemies or or just uh, uh you know people we know Beings we know, entities we know. They're not our friends, Smalls. Well, no, they're definitely not our friends. <laughs> but uh, we got out of there. That? We got out of there. And I couldn't do a damn thing, though. I couldn't do a damn thing. You did many a good thing. You found the chamber. and you. That's not a good thing. That's not a good thing, Smalls. Well, uh, your gunshot was just the right uh, was just the right distraction. Yeah, I noticed just a bit of a hitch when the knife was coming down when that night when that gun report went off, and then Thomas here rushing forward. I think it was a combination of all these things. It was just enough to shake his confidence for that one split second. It was good. So, any questions or comments? Or I've got about five minutes. I liked it. I liked yeah, it. It was cool. I felt helpless the entire time. <laughs> Plus, you know, even when I tried. Let's to talk about that for action. a second. Was that good helpless, or like were you deprotagonized? No, it was good. Helpless. It was just like it was real in this character. She was even even when they he discovered it inside. Well, maybe I'll maybe I'll just turn and see if I can flood this and instantly gets caught. And you know, nothing I can. I mean, clearly at this point, this guy is so confident that you know, there's there's nothing I can do. Even, even when well, I've tried to start to do something, you know, the the turning of the wheel. I mean, there's no way to do that stealthily. Right, right. But I mean, I you know, I, I don't mean that I, you know, um. I mean that my he just felt thwarted. Like at that point, I can't do this, and and clearly this guy is so not worried about me doing this. You know, right? There yeah, must there's, be another way. way. Out. Yeah, yeah. I I was thinking as as Smalls was getting up onto the altar. You know, I mean, I'm I'm thankfully I rolled an an ought four. Yeah, but that could have that, <laughs> but that could have easily been you know a a, a big big number. And I, I was just sort of thinking, um, well, this could be it. This could be it for Smalls. So that's the nature of, of, of this game and of this genre. Like, I mean, I as Brian, I'll come up with another character for continuing our, our stories. But this could be the end of Smalls. I, I, I mean, it wasn't, but it could have. It. I guess I was, I was sort of thinking to myself, well, what if he does, if it does end here in this strange space with him bleeding out, uh, you know, uh, on, on the, on an altar to an, uh, to a, an evil power or whatever. I mean, it's, it's just, it, it's, it's such a different, I can't imagine. Well, I don't know. I, I, it's such a different sort of a reality than so many other RPGs or other types of games like this where there's no way that someone's going to 
kind of go along with this and just sort of I don't know I, I think of like Dungeons and Dragons where I think of like paladins uh, would be trying to slay this guy or or would no way would they voluntarily get on the altar or I don't know like we it it, it, it just we're not we're not action heroes Terrence and, and Alfred are not a- action heroes but that's what I like about Alfred might be Alfred might be he's, he's <laughs> <a little> more... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. what I found interesting was through this whole series of many sessions right Terrence McSweeney has been so damaged so stressed by right. events that he's been trying to talk them all away and there's been this endless flow of of conversation but in this confrontation here in the cavern beneath the earth yeah was that was silent. that was weird that was weird. it was I, I think being being in the water you know was was one of those things like i just like the, the, the whole time I'm, I'm imagining being you know in that level of discomfort um and then you know having having morgan you know come back and and you know um seeing you know um seeing uh gavigan sort of you know come back in the state that he was in, you know, all those things. And just, you know, even, even kind of like failing, feeling my, feeling myself break a little bit more with the Sandy Bull. You know, I was thinking about that too, because, you know, Smalls is in, in the face of death and everything else, pretty much, you know, thumbing his nose at this fellow. And uh, the whole time it really just felt like, you know, it wasn't like me, me not knowing what to do. It was like, I felt like Terrence was just busted the whole time. Like he had just gone, gone around this, you know, got, got in this point where like, he just felt completely helpless and 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 just kind of broken, like you know, he, you know, yeah, by that experience. So, how did it feel to be loved by the villain of the piece? Uh, I don't know, Terrence. You want to feel that one first? I didn't feel the love myself, you know. <laughs> right, you you were treated like a like a possession. Yeah, there was, there was no love there, you know. I mean, I for my part, for <clears throat> Alfred's part, you know, that's the that's the love of a. I feel like you know that's the love of as long as you're. That's the love of an obsessed parent for a dutiful child. Like a, I, I'm thinking of like a, a, a probably a terrible analogy, but but one of these like star obsessed parents who puts their child up on stage and sort of loves their kid, but their kid is a vehicle for their ambition, and so it's not it's not the true selfless love of a of a, a true fraternity or a parent to a child or a even a master who truly loves their servant um and 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 uh so you know i feel like i i liked it as a player in the sense that it's a very nuanced villain i mean this per- this is this is the sort of type of person who he's so far into other realities he's so far into his own mystical evolution or devolution whatever it might be he doesn't see himself as a villain he probably thinks of himself as loving somebody like smalls but i think small sees it as yeah this guy is so far down the path of whatever has turned him into what he is that I don't know if this guy remembers what, what a real feeling of fraternity is, what a real feeling of, of bonds are if it doesn't ultimately serve him so I did appreciate I thought of it as this could be something that could be well I was thinking fast, I was thinking like could Smalls use this guy's sort of twisted perception you know uh, could could it be weaponized somehow to be used against him um and i liked that sort of cat and mouse sort of james bond with dr no kind of back and forth where 
we are able to, if not negotiate with this guy, we can at least have a pretense of some sort of civility or, I mean, it's all going to break down because he's got his ultimate goal. But I thought, you know, if we can just humor this guy long enough, we might get out of here. And that's why I was hoping that, that I could, that Smalls could, I don't know. I thought maybe let's turn it over to the book. The book is the chaos factor here. We're all pawns. Like this book is going to outlast all of us, uh, including this would be sorcerer guy. So I'm, that's why I was like, okay, book, <laughs> you know, you're the tiger, the, you're the, you're the cage tiger and all this. Uh, you know, if, if this guy wants to unlock the cage and let you out, we might, none of us might make it out of here, but, I think this guy's in for as many surprises as we are. So I liked, he is a nuanced character. He's not a cartoon villain. He's not a cartoon kind of, you know, oh, he's a fourth level evil cleric and he's evil because he's evil and you have to just. He's, he's a narcissistic gaslighting boyfriend. That's what he is. <laughs> <laughs> Manip you know, manipulative. The that's, horror. That's he, yeah, no, exactly. That, that's, that's what he is, you know. Right. So. Yeah, great stuff. Okay, so before like Smalls is crazy, they're all crazy. Yeah, <laughs> before we have, I have to eject. Um, well, this is a campaign, as you described, it's a, it's a sandbox campaign, so there aren't adventures, there aren't investigations per se. But this is a point where I, uh, it's time to allow the characters to develop in some way mechanically, right. And it's a point where things stop being tragically annoying and upsetting uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So there's some some sense of recovery. You manage to foil the plans of Morgan, or so it seems. You found Gavigan, and he's alive. What state he's in? Well, that remains to be seen. You have you know, bargained for and and received O'Riordan's life in the in the you know in the, the the jaws of death. You're going to get your story. There are some benefits to these positive twists of fate. So you'll receive a what the game calls a sanity reward of four points. Oh, I don't know. Bring me back up to 12. <laughs> and through a lot of this, you were staying within your zones of competence. And so very rarely we needed to roll. So very rarely were we earning checks of testing our skill against against real challenge. But each of you during your your solo research phases were put to the test of trying to find um, answers that were patently obvious. So we'll check uh, library use as, a, as an effort there. And there was a lot of, of persuasion going on. And uh, so we'll check persuasion even though Really, it didn't see a lot of rolling during during the sequence. Uh, it uh, it deserves a check. Do you remember any skill that you used that stuck out to you that uh, that you felt uh, its successful use deserves a check? Not firearms. Not firearms. No. <laughs> oh. Uh, let's see. Just going down the list of skills. I had bargain checked off. I don't know at what point. I'm trying to remember when I tried to use you, bargain, you, but at some you point. You bargained with with James White, the taxi driver. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I don't know if that's worthy of a check, but I, I, I had. I don't know if he's dead, but he's dead to me. Off. <laughs> yeah, he's an odd cookie. I did pick what a, a guy that is, right? I mean, he 
he had to take you out there anyway, but he negotiated for a better price. <laughs> what a bastard. I hate I hate him. Yeah. You may have you may have noticed my mirth during like if you go back oh, yes. and watch it when it gets released. <laughs> oh, There's yeah. a, a certain dark joy in saying, "This guy, yeah. this Jimmy guy." Terrence, yeah. you you swam. I mean, you you were swimming through. No, I would, well, yeah, I, I swam. Mean, you did because you had to you had to like find the other passage. So that that was a bit, and you were you had something touch your. Uh, all kinds of first, things yeah so that might be worthy of a yep that's worth swim. it you can put it you can put a check there so that yeah so, and that that'll cover it for this uh for this thing. oh and i did fist i did to move the book uh uh as the knife was yes. coming down that might as, be he's a you engaged in street pugilism so yes yeah, he's, that's he's, right oh that's true and i i had a scrap with with uh with a known mobster fist. Right. Yeah, pretty, yeah, pretty much. If you put this guy in a fight, he cannot fail. So <laughs> what this means is these these few checked skills, roll them. If you fail them, they will improve. All right. You want me to do them right now or let's do, it do now. you have to? Yeah, well, I got to go. That? Let's do it. Let's do it now real quick. OK, OK. Yep. All right. Do you want to go first, uh, Terrence? I have to get my dice back there, so you go ahead. Okay, I'm going to go first. Okay. Okay, I have Boggin at 60. Let's see what happens. Uh, no, that does not go up. Boggin stays at 60. I have library use at 75. Good luck. Uh, I rolled a 72, so that doesn't go up. <laughs> uh, Persuade, I only have that at 15, so... That's going to go up. I rolled a fifty-five on persuade, so ding, ding, nice. ding. That gets a, that gets a good one. And then fist, uh, which I had of at fifty. Fifty. Yeah. And I rolled an odd one to improve that, so that does not improve. So mechanically, I go up in my persuade, okay. and that's that. Cool. Yep. Oh. McSweeney. All right, I roll against library, and did I actually fail? Oh my God! No, no, I'm sorry. I, it was 85. I got 85, so no, no dice. Mistake. Uh, let's see. Persuasion. 57 versus 55. So yes, no, no, I did not fail. Actually, yeah, I did fail. So how much does that go up by? You rolled 57, and your skill is 55. Yeah, that's correct. So you failed. So it goes up. Yes. yes. Goes Roll up. 10. All right. Okay. I'm going to get one of those five. There you go. Oh, how about that? Uh, I have no swim skill to speak of. Right. So it can right. enter play. It can enter play. It, yeah, yeah de good. default uh, swim is 25 on the calendar okay. sheet. Oh, okay, I see. Well, I have I've rolled an eight. I have succeeded. So apparently, no, I didn't learn a goddamn thing. Didn't learn anything <laughs> about it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah just, I just made it. Uh, and shall I shall I roll lock picking locksmithing? No, I did no. Okay, fine. Yeah, so I've I've gone up with my persuasion a little bit more. So As did time, I by by one point. I rolled my d10 and I got a one. So next time, next oh. time we have another duplicitous <laughs> cabbie, I can I can get him to take us where he was going to take us anyway for another ten dollars yeah. out of my, <laughs> out of out of out of Small's pocket. Right, but I think even beyond, maybe, I, I, and I'm not just trying to console myself for going going up in one skill by one point, but, uh, but uh, I think some of the rewards are, well, first of all, these these characters have stepped, we've taken our first real steps into a broader world, like for for good mm -hmm. or ill, you know, we're aware of other realities. We may have, uh, depending on what shape he's in, we we have saved Alfred. I mean, uh, Albert Gavigan. Now, I don't know if he needs, you know, he may not make it. He may need to be institutionalized. The rest of us, who knows? But if he comes around in some kind of way, we could, we could compare notes with him. We could maybe use him as a, if he's, almost, if he's up almost, for it. Yeah. I like almost shot him out of mercy, mercy, actually. Well, yeah, that was, actually, I was, that was, <laughs> actually, was, I was thinking close, that. So yeah, I was, I was, I was thinking that too. <laughs> like you had the pistol. I'm like, yeah, this guy might need. That yeah. might be the most merciful thing, but that, that was—I almost did that. I wrestled yeah. with that idea, or you know, yeah. 
Makes yeah, me definitely wrestle with you, that. You would have been justified. It wasn't a. I mean, at the point that he was at and the place we were, yeah. But uh, but we got him out. So I don't know if he'll be if he'll be cogent. But if if he is, it's certainly a relationship be, you could try to build. Yeah. We could, yeah, we could see if he's open to it. He might he might not. We don't know what kind of person he is, but we'll see. Um. So there's a lot of there's a lot of story threads that we still haven't even. Um, you know, I don't know how deeply we want to look into Morgan, like him. Like we may want to give him a wide berth. We may want to discreetly look into Morgan. Like what? What's the deal? How do you go from being a mob boss to that? You know, I don't. I don't care, Smalls. I just get. Let's just get a cup of chowder and maybe another shot of your aunt's whiskey. How about that? Can we do All that, right. please? All right. As we're huddling no, around the fire, I think about Morgan. All right. Yeah. You so need my to last dry question. Clothes. My last question before I really, really do eject is, it was a horror game. I think there was horror. Oh, yeah. Was it Lovecraftian cosmic horror or just horror? Yeah, both. I mean, you know, not in, the, not in the grandiose Lovecraftian Dunwich horror sort of thing, <laughs> but in some of the other sort of more, like more subtle um, ways where, like you know, you, you know, the, the, you as a character or you as a reader, it's this giant vista isn't revealed to you, but it's like this narrower focus of like, man, this is really like a Pickman's this model is. kind of. Yeah, yeah, exactly, or, exactly. Well, Herbert West I, the animator, <laughs> right? Exactly. Yeah, it, was, it was a lot more like that, where you you get this like glimpse, and it's kind of a fuzzy glimpse. You know, it's not, you know. It's not. It's not a Dunwich horror or like a, an, an in's mouth or something like that. You know. Well, I see it a, as a, a, there's a there's a sense of lingering disquiet. You know, oh, there's, there's disquiet. No, yes, disquiet. There's a you know deeply troubled. I think I think we we come away with this I've sense of stuff on my chest now. I've got carvings yeah. in my chest. Disquiet. Listen, listen, small. <laughs> there's more than just disquiet. This is, yeah. <laughs> yeah, this, but this wasn't, when I think of like horror, I mean, there's so many varieties of horror, but cosmic horror, that's what I, I think of. I think of the two of us as protagonists, you know, we'll never quite look at the world the same way again. Victims, maybe. If protagonist equals victim, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but even like the spaces between space, you know what I mean? Like when we, when you almost like, I don't know, like when we pass by a, a reflective surface, like it, it, did something move in the in the that we, you know what I mean? Like this, this is something, something, yeah. something, something. There are things moving in the spaces in between. I mean, we just saw one drag Gavigan, literally right. drag a man into a, you know, there's something. There are things moving in spaces that we didn't even know and the, existed and the entanglement with McSweeney and and Gavigan yeah yeah the entanglement there um the the perverse relationship that Smalls has with that book or had with that book that sort of you know reacting to a an object as a as a as an and we saw it having its own life like it had its own it it was physically manifesting it, its its will over and again so that to me is sort of cosmic horror that these two protagonists now are aware even if it's disjointed and confused that there's a real there are realities that that we have to reckon with that that if we opened our mouths and we tried to tell our story to other people they would think we were insane and that's very lovecraftian i think that that to us this is all very very real and it makes a certain kind of a sense that's why you're a typewriter smalls that's why you're a typewriter right Right, right, yeah, yeah. So, so it's not horror in the sense of like we escape Freddy Krueger, we escape the Mad Slasher, or you know the haunted house. Or, I mean, I don't know. It, it's got. It, it's more of a. There are realities that we've been. We've and then, been the, yeah, and then 
the book and the knife all came together and can't, can't publish that. Um, let's try it again. You know, I can't, I can't submit that to my editor. Yeah, good luck. Yeah. Good luck putting that piece together. All right. So one of the things that can come up in this kind of play is you, know, you start asking yourself, well, like Ivan did earlier, did I really accomplish anything because some of the mechanisms of play have been hidden in this in this approach right? you're not seeing the die rolls or you're not hearing die rolls and what did i actually accomplish anything or did you know or was a story delivered right everything that you did mattered and you were free to do anything terrence didn't have to go into eddie's office in session one right Alfred Smalls didn't have to investigate the book and push and challenge the book and develop his relationship with the book. Right. The acceleration of certain things or the, the aggressiveness of certain things are prompted by aggressive behavior on your, on your own, like Callum and Terrence going to the warehouse in session two definitely involve them in a in a very very different way than would have happened had they not gone there right. i don't know who that's who had that stupid idea and even the ending yeah. was the result of proactive action on your on your parts So I, I, I find that fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I do too. I didn't know if, if after I was, well, first of all, I was lucky enough to, to, to get the, like, like Terrence shot the, the pistol and then I moved the book to obstruct the knife. I didn't know at that point if, okay, great. Uh, that's all good. But these guys are still standing there. They didn't all go up in some fiery magical blast, you know, like no, you know, like crush you, man, you ruined everything, you know. And then, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, <laughs> they're standing yeah. there, and it's like, ah, uh, okay. I didn't know if they were gonna be like, no, you know, now we fight you because you know you've spoiled. I thought it was a very nuanced sort of a. Uh, you know, okay, now we, you know, you know, fate has decreed we go this way. So I found that to be very, um, very nuanced and also in its own way, very Lovecraftian because um, I, I think Lovecraft, I'm thinking of the shadow over Innsmouth where um, the protagonist in that story is being chased quote unquote by the residents of Innsmouth only to find out later that he has a, a connection to Innsmouth and that they maybe not they maybe they weren't chasing him to get him after you know they they were mm -hmm. there was that was its own sort of weird form of yeah its own form of weird love like you know we're trying to bring you into the fold so this guy I mean, yeah, it was a very um, interesting parting of the ways, and a, a very interesting way to end the 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 first investigation. So, yeah, yeah. good. I am happy. I must leave in uh, happiness, well, but I'm well, sad to part for, from you both. Well, only until next time, right? Until, until next time. time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Take care, guys. Take it easy. Good night. <laughs> good night, all. What will be, will be. <laughs>